Thanksgivings and thanksgivings be made for everything, for kings and all those who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil, tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good, and it pleases God our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. This morning, in light of uh, the July 4th holiday, before we dive into the book of Titus, I want us to spend some time praying for our country. Praying specifically, as Paul says here, for all those who are in authority. That we might live a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. Rel Lackland is one of our elders, and he's going to come this morning, and he's going to lead us in this prayer. And here's what I want you to do. If you have served our country in our armed forces in the past, or if you are currently serving, I'd like, you to, I'd like to invite you up to join us in prayer. Uh, if you are currently a public servant, if you are in law enforcement, or if you're serving in some political office somewhere, maybe here or elsewhere. I'd also like to invite you to come up and join us. And then if you just feel compelled to come to the altar and join us in prayer while we pray, I want you to feel free to do that. So Rel, if you'll come now and any others uh, who would like to come and join us, uh, please feel free to do that this morning. Rel, pray for us. Sure. When uh, my daughter is when Mike asked me to uh, do this just a few moments ago, I thought, um, you know, what could I say that would uh, bring honor uh, to us and to our country? And I thought, you know, the prayer of Daniel, which is in chapter 9, <clears throat> I would highly recommend, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> I would highly recommend that you uh, really read that. Daniel was in a country that had been all basically. He was in Babylon, not Israel. He was a Jew. And uh, his country had been ransacked. Women had been killed. Our nation is not there yet to believe it. It is, uh, it's tough right now in America. But I want you to think what country would you rather be in? Would you rather be in China? Japan? Singapore, where I was in 1989? I don't think so. There's not a country anywhere that is like America. So as I pray, I want you to think about that, and I do recommend that you really read that ninth chapter of Daniel to get a feel for what that righteous man did in his day. So let's pray. Father God, I just thank you. I thank you for what you are doing in our nation. And Lord, I look out and I know that there are vast, vast numbers of people in our country who do not honor you, who do not give you a thought any day during the year. But Father, I just pray that you would help us to be a remnant, to be ones who do honor you, who do exalt your name. Because I know, Lord, that you have a good end plan for each and every one of us. I thank you for the men and the women who have fought and given their lives for our country. And I thank you for the freedoms that we enjoy because of their bravery. Help us, Lord, to honor their memory. Help us to stand firm in the face of anything that would come our way. And God, I pray for this service today and as we begin this new study in the book of Titus. Open our minds and open our hearts to receive that word that's brought to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. 
Pope's letter to Titus. That's where we're going to launch in today, and we'll be there for the next several weeks. And before we uh, step foot in chapter 1 and work our way through verses uh, 1 through 4 today, uh, just a few words uh, about this little three-chapter letter. Uh, and they all begin with P. Okay, I'm a preacher. All right, so alliteration is helpful for me. Maybe it'll be helpful for you, I don't know. But the book of Titus is a personal letter. All right, we're not looking at a theological or philosophical treatise this morning. This is not some kind of little piece of information that was written on a faraway mountain somewhere where Paul was secluded away from the world and he was contemplating Paul's deep thoughts. Okay? Verse 4 of chapter 1 says, To Titus, my true child in a common <coughs> This is a letter from a father in the faith to a son. From someone who has been out planting churches and sharing the gospel all over the Mediterranean world. And somewhere along the way he got hooked up with Titus and he had invested a lot in Titus. In fact, he had left Titus on the island of Crete to finish the work that they had begun there at some point earlier in Paul's ministry. So, so what you're looking at is personal correspondence. From one gospel worker to another. You're also looking at a particular letter. Meaning, it's written to a particular person and a particular group of people in a particular place. Look at verse 5 of chapter 1. Paul says, Titus, this is why I left you in what? Crete. Now, Crete is a Mediterranean island off the coast of Greece. It's one of the largest islands in the Mediterranean. It's about 150 miles long. At its widest point, it's about 35 miles. At its least widest point, it's about 7.5 miles. There's a mountain range that runs across the entire island. Some of those mountains, 8,000 feet high. And in Paul's day, there were probably about 20 cities or villages, particularly along the coast, most of them along the northern coast, because on the southern coast, the mountains kind of drop off into the sea. Now, how many of you, has anybody ever been to Crete? All right, okay. Now, from the pictures that I've seen, it is an absolutely beautiful, beautiful place. And I'm sure it was very beautiful in terms of nature in Paul's day, but the people were not beautiful. Okay? It was an ugly place. In fact, to be known as a Cretan in Paul's day would to be, was to be known as a liar. In fact, in the language of the day, if somebody accused you of Cretanizing, they would have been accusing you of lying. It was used as a slang word. A lot of the men on the island hired them out, hired themselves out as mercenary soldiers. A lot of the young women on the island had embraced something called the idea of the new Roman woman. They didn't want anything to do with married life or with raising kids. Instead, they just wanted to live promiscuous, pleasure at any cost kind of lifestyles. So in terms of a particular place, Paul was writing to an island full of people, some of whom had embraced the gospel, but many of whom weren't connecting the dots between the gospel and everyday life as they should have been. In fact, it was tough going for them because some false teachers had invaded the little house churches there and were tending to lead the people astray. They were painting a picture of a different God than the living God of Scripture and thus leading the people in those churches to lead a different kind of lifestyle than the gospel would lead us to lead. So it's a personal letter, a particular letter. It's also a very pointed letter. Okay? It's short. It's three chapters. It's full of a lot of commands. In fact, in many places, Paul just gets right to the point. He doesn't sidestep the issues. He just says, Titus, this is the way it has to be. Okay? Let me give you one example. Verse 10 of chapter 1. Paul is instructing Titus about what's to be done 
with the false teachers in the church. He says, For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. Now we'll, we'll get to that later in terms of specifics. But notice what he says in verse 11. They must be what? Silenced. Silenced. Since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. And then he summarizes uh, in verse 16 when he says, They profess to know God, but they deny Him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. He says, shut them up. Throw them out of the church. They're deceiving God's people. Have nothing to do with them. They are worthless. Talk about not mincing words, right? <laughs> Deal with it. Now. There's an urgency in the letter. And when you read through it, you'll find several other commands like that. In fact, um, verse 15 of chapter 2 is another one. Paul has just given Titus a set of specific instructions and he says, declare these things. Exhort, rebuke, with all authority, let no one disregard you. Now I'm a preacher, I like that verse. <laughs> he says, exhort, rebuke with all authority, don't let anyone pay you no mind. Make sure they listen to you. So it's a pointed letter, but it's also a very practical letter. You see, the letter to Titus is all about connecting the dots between eternal life and everyday life. You see, the false teachers in the churches there were teaching a different vision and understanding of God than what Paul had been given in the gospel or what the Old Testament scriptures put on display. And that particular understanding of God, it was leading those people in those churches to live an anti-gospel kind of lifestyle, a lifestyle that reflected false gods and goddesses rather than the life that had been given to them through Jesus and in the power of the living God. And so it's the kind of letter that's very practical in the sense that Paul is pushing and pressing Titus to take the truth of God's word and apply it to the nuts and the bolts, the nooks and the crannies of everyday life. So it's very practical in that sense. And in terms of a theme, if you wanted to trace and chase a theme through the entire letter, I would, I would say that uh, the theme you're probably going to come to, or at least I did, is this idea of the good life. Now watch with me. If you've got your Bibles open and you don't mind writing in your Bible, I want you to circle some instances of this idea of goodness, okay? <laughs> Verse 8 of chapter 1, Paul is talking with Titus about the kinds of men who are to be placed in leadership within these churches. And he describes them as hospitable and lovers of what? Good. Lovers of what is good. Verse 16 of chapter 1, and we just read this. He says, they, the false teachers, profess to know God, but by their way of life, they betray the fact that they really don't, okay? They're detestable, disobedient, unfit for what? Any good work. Notice over in chapter 2, in verse 3, Paul is talking specifically to the older women in the church. He says, older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior. Not slanderers or slaves to much wine. Ladies, don't get drunk. Okay? Instead, you are to teach what? What is good, and so train the young women. Verse 7, speaking directly to Titus about his role within the church. He says, show yourself in all respects to be a model of what? Good works. In other words, Titus, if there's no one else in the entire community that the people around you can look to as a model for godliness, they at least ought to be able to look at your life and see what it's like to live in light of the gospel. Verse 10. Verse 10. Paul is talking specifically through Titus to household servants. And he says, these particular servants should not be pilfering, but showing all what? Good faith 
so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. In other words, they weren't to take advantage of their employers, their, their masters. Instead, they were to serve them and to do so as unto the Lord. And by living a lifestyle of integrity as employees, that's how we might think of it today, they were to adorn or to make beautiful the gospel by their way of life. Look again in chapter 2, verse 14, talking about Jesus. Paul says, Who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who were zealous for what? Good works. It's that idea of connecting the dots between gospel and good life. Gospel and godly living. Look again in chapter 3, verse 1. Remind them, remind the churches to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, and to be ready for what? Every good work. Again, the emphasis, the push, the press is on living out your faith. Verse 4 again. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us. Now what is that salvation meant to do? Look at verse 8. The saying is trustworthy. And I want you to insist on these things. So that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to what? Good works. Again, the connection. Notice what he says. I want you to insist on those things. That those who have believed in God may be careful to live a life directly connected with what God has done for them. And then finally, in verse 14 of chapter 3, and let our people learn to devote themselves to what? Good works. So as to help cases of urgent need and not be unfaithful. So throughout Paul's letter to Titus, this idea of goodness comes up over and over and over again. And fundamentally, it's about how the goodness of God who has shown himself to be incredibly gracious to us by sending his son Jesus to earth to pay a price we could never pay. It's about how that goodness intersects with, impacts our life, and changes us into truly good people who live out the goodness of God in our everyday lives. Thus, we've titled this series... The good life. Now, throughout history, okay, there have been all kinds of different ideas regarding what the good life is. First of all, a little bit of a definition, okay? People tend to define the good life very simply as the life that one would like to live. People have tended to define the good life, let's look again, as the life that one would like to live. Now I want you to close your eyes for just a second. Would you like to live? What kinds of visions come into your own imagination regarding the good life? If I could set up shop at Disney World, and just go in and out to every park every single day for the rest of my life, that might be something of the good life. What about you? What's the good life look like for you? You can open your eyes now. Some people in the past have defined the good life as the moral kind of life. The life lived by the rules. The life abiding by a certain code of conduct. If you can say you've done more good than more bad, guess what? You can feel good about the good life you've lived. Some people in the past have equated the good life with a life of pleasure, with a life of excess, with a life of doing whatever I want, with whoever I want, whenever I want it, no matter how much it costs. Now, in many ways that describes our culture. Western culture is very much a pleasure-centered pleasure kind of culture. And some people have thought 
that at the end of the day, all the pleasure that you can accumulate will ultimately amount to the good life. Now, some people have thought of the good life as the fulfilled life. The happy life. You know the kind of life you live where when you retire and you're sitting on your front porch looking out over the mountains or you're sitting in your recliner in the morning, you're enjoying that cup of coffee and you don't have to worry about going to work anymore and you just go, ah. We did all right. We raised up kids. They didn't turn out half bad. Got a little safe for retirement. We can take a vacation every now and then. It's just pretty good. It's pretty fulfilling. The happy life. Some people think of the good life as the meaningful life. In other words, did you know that one of the major things that people regret when they're about to pass away is whether or not their life past had enough meaning to it? Did I do enough for my kids? Did I do enough for my community? Did I invest enough in the people that God had placed around me? It's rarely ever, whew, man, I should have stayed at the office a couple of hours longer last night. Man, I just didn't give enough time to my boss. No, no. Now, the meaningful life looks back and says, did my life matter? A lot of people at the end look at that as the good life. And then there are those who look at the good life as a finished life. As a life where you're about to cross the finish line and you can look back over the whole picture and you can say, man, I can die happy. I can die fulfilled. I know that my time has come. My life is over, but man, it was a good run. Some people see that as the good. But when you trace that theme through Paul's letter to Titus, you find an entirely different picture. You find through the person of Paul, and as he makes this personal investment in Timothy, that the good life, biblically speaking, is a life of gospel purpose and a life of gospel investment. I want you to see those two things in particular this morning. In verses 1 through 4 of chapter 1. If you'll turn there with me, if you're not already there, let's walk through these four verses. Paul, a servant of God, and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began, and at the proper time manifested in his word through the priest with which I have been entrusted by the command of God our Savior. A couple of things here at the very outset that I want you to notice, okay? Paul identifies himself as the writer of the letter to Titus, his son in the common faith, and he does so two ways. He calls himself a servant of God, and he calls himself an apostle of Jesus Christ. In other words, his primary identifiers, personally speaking, have to do with the fact that he himself is in submission to and under the service of God who called him to faith and called him to service and in submission to King Jesus who made him literally a sent one, an apostle, a messenger with a message for the nations. Now you have to go all the way back to the beginning of Paul's story to see how this came about. Okay, Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. It's back to just a few books. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts in the New Testament. Acts chapter 9. When a guy by the name of Saul met the Lord Jesus on the road to Damascus, his life was radically changed. Before that transformation, this guy named Saul was in the business of persecuting the church of the living God. And that's what we put in at the beginning of Acts 9. Listen to what uh, Luke writes for us. He says, but Saul, 
still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters to the synagogues at Damascus. So that he found, so that if he found any belonging to the way, that was the first term used to describe Christians. Men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. You think that gets your attention? Yeah. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I'm Jesus, whom you were persecuted. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what to do. The men who were traveling with him, they stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were open, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here am I, Lord. Now here's the picture of a servant of the Lord, okay? This, this disciple of the Lord Jesus who was ready to go and to do whatever Jesus wanted him to do. Until Jesus says, I want you to do this. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to a street called Straight, and at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, uh, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how evil he has, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has the authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. Now listen to the Lord's words. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So at the very outset of his journey with the Lord, the Lord Jesus arrests this man named Saul on the road to Damascus, he basically says, you're mine. And through grace and by faith, this man named Saul comes into a living relationship with Jesus. And he's changed, radically transformed from this point on, such that the Lord tells Ananias that this man whom you think is going to kill you if you go see him is actually a changed man. He's now an instrument of mine. In other words, he's gone from serving himself to now being my son. And I've chosen him. And I've set him apart for a specific mission. An apostolic mission. In fact, he's going to bear my name to the nations. He's going to carry the word of the gospel to peoples all over the place. And so he did. Thus, this little letter. At some point along the way, Paul and Titus had gone to Crete and they had preached the gospel. Churches had been established. And Paul had left Titus behind to set everything in order. And so he writes to him with some instructions to do that. And he says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. How many of you would want nothing more than to be known as simply a servant of God? What humility from a man who wrote 13 letters in the New Testament is probably the greatest missionary in the history of the church who identifies himself at the very outset of this letter by saying, look, I'm, I'm just a servant. God called me and I said yes. And I'm doing exactly what God wants me to do. Now here's the reality. You and I are going to serve someone. Think. Someone at some point in the past sung those words. Right? There's a Dylan song. If you're old enough to know who Bob Dylan is. And that song speaks so much truth. He says you've got to serve somebody. You will either serve yourself and your own desires, 
or you will serve a God of your own making. You will bow down to it. You will give your life to it. But I guarantee you, you will serve somebody. The question is, who? The invitation today to everyone in this room is to come and to surrender yourself to the living God like Paul did and to find that serving Him is the most freeing thing you will ever do. Paul did not find his life's calling and purpose. He did not find freedom for his soul until he bowed the knee to Jesus. And no matter what he suffered throughout the rest of his life, he knew that he belonged to Christ and that Christ had given him everything and that was enough. So Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Christ Jesus, Paul's life purpose was now going forth with this good news. And look at the rest of verse 1. He says, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth which accords with God." Paul was sent forth by the Lord Jesus as a messenger with a purpose. That those whom God had set apart for himself might come to faith through the preaching of the gospel message. And that as the truth was preached further to them, that they might grow in it. That their knowledge might expand and it might translate into godly living. So Paul saw his purpose as a messenger of the living Christ as being for the sake of the church. You see, it's not just today about who your master is. It's about why you're here. Why are you on this planet? Why are you taking up space? Why are you breathing in oxygen and breathing out carbon dioxide? What about your personality? What about your passions? What about your gifts? What about the family that God has placed around you? What about the friends? What about the influence that you have in your little circle, wherever you are? Why are you here? What is your for the sake of? Now, you and I are not apostles, okay? There were 12 of them. We don't have them anymore. What we have is their testimony in the Word of God. And so we are still under their authority because they've given us the scriptures and through them we're under the authority of Christ. But even though you and I don't have that calling, I guarantee you that God made you not only to know Him and to serve Him, but to have a purpose in life. What is your for the sake of? Is it for the sake of a comfortable retirement? Is it for the sake of the exotic vacation? Is it for the sake of the bigger home? Is it for the sake of filling the blanks? Remember how we talked about the good one. What is your for the sake of? That will tell you what your vision of the good life is. But the good life is not just a life of gospel purpose. It's not only to be aimed in a particular direction. The good life is a life of gospel investment. Notice specifically again what Paul invests himself in. For the sake of the faith of God's elect in their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness in hope of eternal life. Paul has an eternal investment mindset. Forget for just a second about retirement all by itself. You and I can have as much in retirement as we might deem necessary for us to live out the rest of our days. But guess what? A, it'll eventually run out. B, just like the writer of Ecclesiastes said, you'll die. And if it's not run out, what's going to happen? Somebody else is going to get it. So then the question becomes, while those kinds of investments are good and helpful and healthy, what about eternal investments? What about the kind of eternal investments Paul was making with his life? The kind of investments that look like sharing the gospel with family and friends and neighbors in hopes that they, by the grace of God, might come to know Him and might receive from Him the gift of eternal life. What about the kind of investment in people's godliness that Paul talks about? 
What about the kind of investment that recognizes that more than anything else, someone coming to Jesus and becoming and like Jesus is really the most important thing in life. And you and I don't have to be apostles. And we don't have to be in full-time ministry to share in that call. That calling to disciple others is a calling given to all of us in this room. The only difference is where you and I get our paychecks. That's it. We're all called into ministry. We're all called to reflect and to respond to God's call on our lives that we be servants and that we be gospel investors. So just some questions this morning. Are you and I sharing the good news of the promise of eternal life with those whom God has placed around us? Are you and I praying that God will bring those around us to faith in Christ as we plant those gospel seeds? Are you and I helping others to connect the dots between the eternal kind of life and the everyday lives that God has called us to live? Are you and I living in such a way that others can see that clear connection in our own lives? Bottom line, are you attractive? Now, I mean that question in a different way than you might immediately take it. In other words, do you smell like the gospel? Do you dress the part? Do you look the part? Do your words and your everyday way of life indicate that you are in the business of making gospel investments? Now, that doesn't require you to wear a suit and tie, but it does require you and I every day to clothe ourselves with Jesus as Paul talks about elsewhere. And then to put him on display in our relationships. To do as Paul was doing and to live for the sake of the glory of his name and the true, true eternal good of others. But notice here that it's not just about what you're investing in. It's not just about the eternal investment you make. It's also about who. Notice again in verse 4 what Paul says. He says, to Titus, my true child in a common faith. Paul's writing this letter as a father to a son in the faith. He's writing this letter as one who has been invested in by Jesus and who is now investing in the life and in the ministry and ultimately in the legacy of this one who had truly become beloved to him. This, this gospel partner. In verse 5 of chapter 1, Paul tells Titus to invest in new church leadership, to take what he's been given and to raise up elders, shepherds, in these churches in Crete. In verses 1 and 7 of chapter 2, Paul tells Titus to invest from church leadership into church membership to teach and to be a model of godliness before the churches, that they might too begin to look more like Jesus. In verse 3 of chapter 2, Paul talks about older women investing in younger women, about church member to church member making gospel investments in one another's godliness. In verse 5 of chapter 2, Paul writes specifically through Titus to the younger women in the church to get married, and to begin raising families with their husbands so that they can invest in a gospel legacy in the next generation. And ultimately, that's, that's, that's what the good life is. It's living a life of gospel purpose and making gospel investments in people along the way. By the time that Paul wrote this, letter in the mid-60s, he was probably coming to the end of his life. And so he writes to leave a legacy. He writes to invest in younger pastors who can continue carrying on the gospel ministry that he was given from the Lord. And you and I, we've been given that legacy too. Who are you investing in? Old people, there's a place for you. Okay? A lot of times, and I've experienced this before, 
Older folks in the church think maybe that they've put in their years. They've put in their time. They've done their duty serving in the nursery or in the kids' ministry or on the worship team. It's now it's time for other folks to take over. And that's all well and good, but not without your help, not without your support, not without your investment. We'll get there in due time, but Paul says in this letter that discipleship happens not so much in here as it does out there with older men pouring into younger men and older women pouring into younger women. That's what happens. Naturally, organically, relation. So young married woman, let's say day in and day out, you are shaking your head because you don't know how to love that rascal a husband that God's given. Okay? What's, what's the answer according to this letter? Go find a godly woman who's loved a rascal of a husband for 50 years and say, okay, tell me your secret. How do you do it? Because I've seen him and I've seen you and I don't get it. Okay? That's how it happens. But in that scenario... The older people in the church have to be mature in the gospel and they have to recognize their God-given task of pouring into the younger. And the younger have to say, we want that. We want that. So young women, young men, who are you seeking out? Who are you asking? Don't wait for somebody to come to you. Go to them. Go and say, I want help learning how to be a follower of Jesus as a young married man or a young married woman or as a young parent. Go seek it out. That's how it happens. It happens life on life, relationship to relationship. As people further down the road from you model what godly living looks like and you just follow in their footsteps. That's how it happens. So husbands, Invest in your wives. Wives, invest in your husbands. Parents, invest in your kids. You're further down the road than they are, or at least I hope you are. Invest in older men. Invest in younger men. Older women, invest in younger women. And here's the kicker. This good life, this life of gospel purpose, and gospel investment, it's all fueled at every step along the way by God's grace. My favorite passage in the entire New Testament is in this little letter. Chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. I would ask you, I would encourage you to write these verses down on an index card, put it in your Bible just like I've done, and memorize chapter 2, verses 11 through 14 as we walk through this series. It is central to what Paul is saying about how the gospel is what fuels the good life. Listen to what he says. He says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. And we'll stop right there. But I want you to notice what Paul says. He says it's grace. It's unmerited favor. It's God's love showered upon undeserving people that not only saves us, but trains us through the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit to live godly kinds of lives. To live the kinds of lives that reflect the goodness of God into our everyday lives. Lives. I love how Tim Chester says it in his uh, commentary on Titus. He says, the truth that creates a good life is the gospel. That is the truth that brings life and then changes life. That is the truth that brings life and then changes life. And Paul says throughout this letter that we have to continually fight to keep those two connected. Eternal life and everyday life. In and through Jesus they go like 
Now this little letter is good for us because there are so many competing visions in our own day of what the good life is and what it can be. Some of those visions, some of those visions of the good life are found in the most unsuspected kinds of places. In 2011, a young woman brought before uh, a publisher a particular idea. And she brought this before the publisher and that publisher rejected it, so she took it in front of another publisher and finally was able to convince someone to publish her idea. And it went on to sell millions and millions of copies and spawn all kinds of other copies and kinds. You know what that was? The first adult coloring book. In 2015, the adult coloring book was selling well into the tens of millions of copies. And you may not have thought about this, but the adult coloring book offers all of us a particular vision of the good life. Think about it. How many adult coloring books offer you pictures of cityscapes and electronic devices and stressful things for you to color in your spare time? How many of them? None. None of them. None. How many of them are based around fantasy themes, right? Fantasy literature themes or fantasy type mythology themes or how many of them are based around nature scapes and nature themes? What's the answer? All of them. Every one of them. And the real question that psychologists and even some of the publishers had that just, they couldn't get their head around was why these things became so incredibly popular. Adults wanting to color? Like, what is that? But here's what those things did. And I'm not downing adult coloring books, okay? Like, my wife has some of them. Right? But what I want you to see is that there's a particular vision of the good life at work there. A vision that says, guess what? You, you can escape the world you have, the life that you have, and go into this kind of relaxed, mindful mode, or you can just color. And guess what? In that world, as you color your own nature scape in the way that you choose, you get to be sovereign. You get to be what? Say it. God. And you get to create, and you get to play, and you get to do whatever you want to until this thing's as beautiful as you think it should be. Y'all, there's a vision of the good life at work. And those aren't bad things. But I, but I bring that up to show you that there are all kinds of visions of the good life that work in our culture that just work on us all the time without us even seeing it. They work at the level of the imagination. And so we need a book like the book of Titus to kind of wake us up, to shake us just a little bit and say, whoa, 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 whoa. Coloring books are fine, but they won't lead you to the good life. Only Jesus does. Only the grace of God in and through Jesus Christ will guarantee you not just the good life, but the eternal kind of life. The eternal kind of life that's to be lived where? Right here, right now in response to the gospel, a life of gospel purpose and gospel investment. That's what the good life is. And even though Paul suffered tremendously in his life, I guarantee you that right now, this very day, if he could stand here in front of us, he would not do it all over again any other way. That's a good one. And if you're here today, and you don't know Jesus, and you're searching, and you're seeking, and you're trying to invest in all kinds of things that you hope and believe and think and dream that will make you happy, and they'll give you meaning and fulfillment and joy and purpose. It's not Jesus. It won't. Be. 